My guest at this time is Grace Marie Turner. She is president of the Galen Institute, one of the most respected health policy firms in the nation. She joins me today to talk about what ought to be expected of a government when there is a threat such as the coronavirus uh, presented to its leaders, what the government is capable of, and and uh, what would be excessive expectations. And Grace Marie, thanks so much for being with us. Greg, always a pleasure. Well, not a surprise, I guess, in our current day and age that uh, it's already being politicized before there are even a lot of cases in the United States. But uh, yesterday, of course, we saw the president uh, tapping the vice president to oversee this. Health and Human Services, Centers for Disease Control are obviously going to be very active in this. Uh, This isn't the first time that uh, a virus has caused concern in our country. So what's the general protocol for addressing something like this? Uh, there really there are protocols in place, and obviously every every outbreak is new and has its own signature, and this is is absolutely no different. But there between the CDC and the the infrastructure in Washington, I think it's actually very smart that the president picked Vice President Pence to oversee this effort because not only does he understand the workings of the federal government have good contacts in Congress, but also as a former governor and state uh, member of Congress, he, he understands the important role of the states. And the federal government can't come in and tell a state to quarantine its citizens. That's just really a, well, our federalist system of government is very active and in play here. And so there has to be a respect between what the capacities and the legal authority is of the various levels of government to make sure that the proper response is, is in place. And what are you seeing so far? Uh, do you believe the federal response has been adequate? And, I, and based on what you just said, uh, you also have as many as 50 state governments and possibly the District of Columbia uh, to address this as well. So uh, you mentioned the federalism aspect of this, but uh, how do you tie it all together and how do you make sure all the states are doing their jobs here? Well, I think that's why it was the president was smart to put a, a one coordinator in place to pull all this together. I am actually at CPAC, and the vice president spoke here uh, about uh, twelve thirty one o'clock. And his schedule also shows that he has a meeting of the Corona Task Force at two thirty. So he's going to be racing back to go have that meeting. There have been meetings every day in Washington. I think primarily overseen by HHS Secretary Alex Azar of the of the Coronavirus Task Force to make sure that that the president has the maximum amount of information possible in order to make decisions about any action. That's why he early on said we do not want flights coming in from Wuhan, China, because that's the epicenter of this illness. And he was criticized initially, but now he's uh, he's saying, and I, I think people are agreeing, that was the right decision. So quick action is really important. Coordinated action is very important. But I think also understanding that there is a significant infrastructure in place, it's important to not cry wolf. They do not want to do something that is too extreme too early on, because if it's not necessary, the next time people won't listen to the to the government. So they have to be judicious. They have to give us as much information as they can. They have to gather as much inform- accurate information as they can. And also, on a whole other level, they're overseeing and pri- trying to really expedite the research aspect of this so that we can get to treatments and vaccines as soon as possible. What about the pressure on nations, and I guess I'm thinking particularly of China, where there's been a lot of concern about whether the Chinese officials are giving us uh, accurate information on this? Uh, How do you try to compel them to do that without alienating them. That, I think that's really that's one of the fine lines that they're walking. When, when you do hear officials in Washington talking about the numbers in China, they always qualify them. Because China, of course, has a vested interest in saying that it's contained and that the outbreak is actually not as serious as it as initially seemed to be. Uh, on the other side, you see here people going into hysterics before we really have the information that we need. I think the most important thing is for people to be aware and to re- to recognize that that if the government were to at, at a state level or federal level were to make a decision 
that it believes is in the interest of protecting the public safety to respect that. And we all have to be prepared, wash our hands as, as often as we, as whenever we're out in public. If anybody is coughing or sneezing around you, get, get away from it. Make sure that you have all the meds you need. They're saying people should have two or three weeks worth of their medications on hand just in case someone should have to be self-quarantined. So there are a lot of things that people can do to be aware. I've heard that Costco is sold out of its, uh, its emergency preparedness kits, and so people are clearly getting ready to take care of themselves, but, but we are not at a point yet and hopefully will not get there because of the efforts in place to contain the virus that it becomes a, a, a serious national emergency. Grace Marie, this might be hard to quantify, but uh, since we are in a political era now where uh, just about every particular issue that you can possibly think of takes on a political element, regardless of what happens here, you're going to have some folks who think the government did well and some folks who think the government, and particularly the president, uh, didn't do well. So when you see a response, and uh, whether there's uh, a lot of fatalities or a lot of people coming down with the virus, how will you gauge how the government did here? What are signs that things should have been done but weren't done or should have been done better? And and what are indications of, yeah, this got pretty bad, but the government did everything it could? Well, I, I, as I said, there's, there's just no way to know how this virus is going to play out. Apparently, it's, uh, it's, its fatality rate and its level of transmission are both are both very high, and so that's one of the reasons that you've seen you've seen it spread so quickly. It also, um, I think that's why the federal government is particularly wanting to step out in front, keep people informed, assure them that they're doing everything that is reasonable to do, but not panicking so that they are they're protecting us. But we don't know right now where this virus is apparently there's one there's one person in northern california that has the virus and did not go to china and is not aware of having been in contact with anyone who did so they're doing a lot of work the public health agencies to try to figure out who did you have contact with how many people did you talk to let's test them so there's there's a lot of infrastructure and i think that's one of the things that's really important the United States talks about, we talk about having the highest and most extensive health care system in the, in the world. Well, we also have a lot of infrastructure, maybe even some redundancy. But that's actually what you need when you have this kind of a threat. You need to be able to act quickly. You need to be able to get tests done as soon as possible. You need to be able to have the research capacity amped up so that we get the get any treatments and vaccines that, that will be developed to the market and to patients as soon as possible. There is a huge amount of infrastructure capacity in this country to do that, and I frankly think the world is looking at us to take a leadership role, and we take that seriously. And in a number of ways, several of which you just outlined, Grace Marie, there is an expectation for the government to be on top of those things. Uh, however, in the media, of course, uh, there's almost this plea of how will the government save us? And as you pointed out from your previous responses, the government does have certain responsibilities in a situation like this. But so do individuals to take the steps necessary, like you said, to wash your hands, try and stay away uh, from folks if you can, and uh, and let this ride out. So it's not just uh, leaving everything up to the government to solve everything. No, and isn't that really the, the statement of how a health health system needs to work? We all need to do as much as we can to take care of ourselves. But we want the government to be there for something that we can't control and to protect us, such as stopping flights, incoming flights from Wuhan, China, so that that's something that the federal government can do. You and I can't do that. You and I can wash our hands and stay away from people that are coughing and, importantly, make sure that if we do think that we have signs and symptoms of this illness, to call your physician right away. An infectious disease specialist I talked with said the worst thing you can do is go straight to the emergency room because everybody else who thinks they might have this virus is going to the emergency room. It's better to call your doctor or to call a health professional first. Ask them what you should do. See what you can do to try to make sure you don't, if you were to have the virus, you're not doing anything to spread so all of us have a responsibility to take care of ourselves, to take care of our families and our communities, and also to listen to the government's recommendations should we get to a point where, where external forces are needed.
Last question, Grace Marie, and you could probably go for an hour on this, but I'm sure you saw, I think it was the Washington Post yesterday that said this coronavirus challenge just proves that we need uh, single payer, Medicare for all, that this is uh, requires a uh, full federal response, and therefore that should be our uh, health care system overall. Oh, my goodness. They need to talk to my friend Sally Pipes from the Pacific Research Institute, who grew up under the Canadian health care system. And she says the same thing. She said single-payer systems have much less capacity to deal with public health threats like this. Their hospitals are stretched to the maximum on just a regular day. They, they have global budgets. They run out of money in November, and they stop surgeries for the next two or three months. People wait in hallways in emergency rooms because there aren't enough beds, there aren't enough bays. A single-payer system is the worst thing you could do. And by the way, in Europe especially, they have decimated their research-based pharmaceutical industries because the price controls do not give them enough resources to also invest in the next generation of pharmaceutical research. So I think that this actually shows why a single-payer health care system would be devastating. And, and when we show the capacity of the private sector to respond, already companies are talking about how they can work together to boost manufacturing capability once a vaccine is found to be able to produce this in mass quantities. You have to have a private sector that's thriving and has the infrastructure and capacity to do that. Single-payer systems dry up those research bases. So they're looking to the, Ameri- to the United States to, to come up with a solution to this, and I think that's very likely where it's going to come from. Grace Murray, we'll let you get back to the action at CPAC. Thank you very much for your time with us today, and we'll be certainly following along as uh, the government and the rest of us deal with this threat. Thanks very much. Thanks, Greg. Grace Murray Turner, president of the Galen Institute. I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for Radio America.